Next CNN's Charles Crawford joins us now as we continue our live coverage of the final countdown at Cape Canaveral. Good morning, Charles. The good situation morning. looks good so far. Indeed it does. And good morning to Mike Mullane, our astronaut who will be with us during the launch. Mike, I think we're in a T minus nine and holding just about the end of that uh, right now at the Cape for the 7.15 a.m. launchers. Live pictures of the Cape. Uh, it looks pretty good. That there are, there are clouds over there. Yeah, it does. It looks, uh, looks uh, much better than what we saw about an hour ago. Uh, we have just had a clear to launch from the range safety officer. However, we are still standing by to uh, hear from the integration council and that everything has been uh, uh, been able to be corrected there and we're ready to go. This is the voice it, of Hugh uh, it looks like we are going to be ready to pick up the count. We will hear from the launch director, Bob Seek. And we can go back. Uh, there was a one small problem, a sailboat that was uh, sailing off of the uh, coast of Florida earlier this morning that uh, NASA officials had to make contact with to tell that boat to get out of the way. He got as close as three miles to the launch site, and uh, they, they weren't kidding, as you can see, a machine gun aboard the uh, NASA helicopter. <laughs> There were no shots fired. <laughs> but there's the sailboat out there, and there's the machine gun. Uh, NASA's had problems in the past with, uh, not sailboats, but planes, private planes flying in the area. This is animation, Mike. You can describe what we're seeing here of the retrieval uh, process that uh, this mission is going to accomplish. Well, assuming everything stays on schedule, on Monday, Joe uh, Allen will don a manned maneuvering unit like this and fly over to the Palapa spacecraft and uh, will latch hold of it with that device that he was carrying. Uh, he will use a man maneuvering unit to stabilize the satellite. Then Anna Fisher will use the remote manipulator arm, operating that from inside the cabin of the shuttle, to grapple both uh, the satellite and uh, Joe Allen, who will be affixed to it. He, she will rotate the satellite so the forward end of it is pointed down. Dale Gardner, standing in a foot restraint in the payload bay, will then start working on the uh, rest of the stowage rescue procedures. All right, we should be now uh, into the T minus nine, so well, let's pick up the voice of Hugh Harris uh, as we enter the last eight minutes of the countdown for liftoff of Discovery. Which then report back to the launch processing system that the commands have been executed successfully. The primary job of the onboard computers is to check that all of the launch commit criteria, such as propellant loads, temperatures, pressures, and other measurements, are normal. We should mention that those pictures we just saw of the uh, retrieval of the satellite, there are two errant satellites up there that were launched back in February and failed to go into proper orbit. And that's the main objective of this T mission. T-minus eight minutes and counting. Everything proceeding smoothly towards a liftoff at 7.15 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. In addition to recovering those two uh, satellites, the Palapa and Westar 6, this mission also will launch and deploy two uh, communication satellites that are stowed in the Coming cargo bay. Coming up on the T minus seven minute 30 second point in the countdown. T minus seven minutes 30 seconds. And the crew access arm is retracting. Which is used knots to get from the service structure to the orbiter. If an emergency should arise, the arm can be put back into position within 15 seconds. Houston is uh, sending a final update to the onboard computer for antenna management, and the AC electrical bus sensors have been placed in monitor by pilot David Walker. T minus seven minutes and counting. That's the white room where the uh, astronauts uh, earlier this morning entered the space vehicle, uh, vehicle. As he said, Mike, you can roll this back into position so you can get out of there in a hurry, huh? That's correct. It's, under, it's actually under computer control if, uh, if there is, a, like in our case, last T -minus June, we had a six minutes, 35 seconds, and counting. The next major milestone will be at the six-minute point when pilot David Walker will be asked to perform the auxiliary power unit pre-start. This consists of positioning a number of switches and verifying that they are in the proper position, then throwing the three propellant isolation valve switches, which allow the hydrazine fuel to start flowing from the tanks toward the APUs. 
As I was saying, that uh, white room will swing back he automatically if there's any problems. Well, with that cloud cover, we may not see a whole lot after launch this morning. Yeah, it's difficult. Walker reporting that the APUs, or auxiliary power units, are now configured for startup. T-minus 5 minutes, 30 seconds, and counting, and the flight recorders are on. The flight recorders provide measurements of shuttle system performance during the entire mission for playback after landing. Coming up on the five minute point in the countdown, where we'll have a go for auxiliary power unit start. Colonel, what are the astronauts doing right at this moment? Well, Dave Walker at the APU. We have a go for orbiter APU start. That's a critical uh, step in the in the countdown. T minus four minutes fifty seconds and counting. The APUs provide hydraulic power to move the aero uh, surfaces and the main engines for steering. The liquid oxygen fill and drain valve in the external tank has been closed, and topping of the tank completed. Liquid oxygen drain bank has been started. This means that the liquid oxygen is flowing through the main propulsion system and back to the large storage tank to cool the system down slowly to 270 degrees below zero so that it will not be shocked by the torrent of super cold fluid at the time of engine ignition. This also ensures that the liquid oxygen in the external tank will remain at the proper liquid state. There are a lot of birds out there this morning. Do they present any problem? On, uh, on ascent, no. Four minutes on, and count. If there was a return to launch site aboard, you, would have, you could have problems. I'm surprised they're, uh, they spend any time around there. You'd think they would have gotten the <laughs> idea by now. It may not be too safe for them. Now, I, don't, I don't know if that memory carries over from flight to flight. <laughs> The Elevon speed brakes and rudders are now being moved through a pre-programmed pattern to ensure that they're capable of doing their jobs during the flight. T-minus three minutes, 28 seconds on internal power. The fuel shells are still sharing the electrical load with the ground support equipment for another minute. Profile check now of the aero surfaces are complete and the engine gimbal or movement check of the main engines is underway to ensure they're ready to control the flight. You can feel that in the cockpit. You feel a vibration as those engines gimbal. T-minus three minutes and counting. The liquid oxygen valve for filling the external tank is closed now and pressurization has begun. After the tank is pressurized, the hold capability is limited to three minutes and 36 seconds. T minus two minutes, 40 seconds. And the pilot, uh, David Walker, has cleared the caution and memory warning every three, four launch. T minus two minutes, 15 seconds, and the main engines have moved to start position and the beanie cap, or the gaseous oxygen vent arm, uh, has been retracted now and is moving off to its uh, position for launch. T-minus two minutes and counting. Liquid oxygen vent valve has been closed and flight pressurization is underway. T-minus one minute, 45 seconds. The computer will automatically verify the readiness of the main engines at the T-minus one minute point. Ninety seconds before launch of 51A. T-minus one minute, 15 seconds, with the liquid hydrogen tank now at flight pressure. What is the, uh, distance Coming up on the one here. minute point, and at that point, That's the fire system away. for the sound suppression water system on the pad is armed. 
T-minus one minute and counting. Obviously, that's The hydrogen counting. igniters under the orbiter's engines have been armed. These devices are used to ensure that any hydrogen flowing through the engines does not accumulate. T-minus 45 seconds. We're just 18 seconds away from switching command of the countdown from the ground computers to the onboard computers. T-minus 31 seconds, and we're switching control of the countdown to the onboard computers. T-minus 25 seconds. Sequencer is now controlling the final seconds. T-minus 20 seconds, Mark. T minus 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. We're go for main engine start. Seven, six, we have main engine start. Three, two, one, and liftoff. Liftoff of Discovery and the first flight to retrieve and return satellites from space and the shuttle has cleared the tower. to 89% uh, then to 67% to pass through the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Throttle down to 67 confirmed. Forty-five seconds. Downrange distance two nautical miles. Altitude 3.9 nautical miles. Velocity 2200 feet per second. Three engines at 67%. Passing through the period of maximum aerodynamic pressure. Beginning throttle up back to 104%, the nominal throttle setting for this mission. Throttle's coming up. Engines at 104%. Discovery Houston, your go at throttle up. Roger, go. Discovery's crew given a go at throttle up, velocity 3,400 feet per second, altitude 12 nautical miles, downrange distance 8 nautical miles. <coughs> 1 minute 45 seconds, velocity 4,500 feet per second, altitude 18 nautical miles, downrange distance 16 nautical miles coming up on SRB separation in about 15 seconds. Thrust tailing off in SRB, standing by for separation. Separation confirmed. Nominal first stage performance. Houston, first stage performance, nominal. Okay, nominal. Those solid rockets, uh, seconds, will be recovered. That's correct. They parachute into the ocean 30 and 30 were picked nautical 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 up by some uh, tugs, towed back and refurbished and used again. I don't know for sure, but I wouldn't be surprised if, if some of those that we just saw used there have been flown on previous flights. Discovery Houston, two-engine tail capability. Three engines running 104%. Three minutes into the flight, velocity 6,400 feet per second, altitude 41 nautical miles, downrange distance 65 nautical miles. With the call-up of two-engine tail capability, uh, Discovery capable of reaching a transatlantic landing at Dakar in the event of an abort uh, with uh, one engine out if necessary. Three minutes, 20 seconds, velocity 7,000 feet per second, altitude 47 nautical miles, downrange distance 83 nautical miles. Status check and mission control. All systems uh, give a go. Three minutes, 40 seconds. Three 
8 minutes 55 seconds. Standing by for negative return, the point at which Discovery can no longer turn around and return to the launch site. Velocity 8,000 feet per second, altitude 53 nautical miles. Discovery, Houston, negative return. Okay, negative return. Discovery at an altitude 55 nautical miles now, 133 nautical miles downrange, velocity 8,700 feet per second. Three liquid fuel to main engines running at 104%. Four minutes, 30 seconds, velocity 9,200 feet per second. Standing by for the two engine press to abort to orbit uh, capability call. Four minutes, 51 seconds, velocity 10,000 feet per second. Altitude 58 nautical miles, downrange distance 187 nautical miles. Discovery Houston, press to ATO. All right, press to ATO. With that call up, Discovery capable of reaching an abort to orbit on only two engines uh, if that were to become necessary. Five minutes, 20 seconds, velocity 11,300 feet per second. Altitude 59 nautical miles. Discovery, Houston, you're pressed to Miko. Pressed to Miko. That call up, Discovery capable of reaching a uh, main engine cutoff on only two engines, if that were necessary. All positions in mission control reporting orbiter systems look good. Five minutes, 45 seconds. Velocity 12,500 feet per second. Altitude 60 nautical miles, downrange distance 275 nautical miles. Well, if that cloud cover holds, we might see the main engine cut off, huh? Yeah, that's a remarkable camera. You're looking at the three main engines of the shuttle Discovery still, uh, still Discovery on where we were. <laughs> single engine TAL capability. Single engine TAL. That call up uh, Discovery capable of reaching a transatlantic abort uh, at Dakar, Senegal, on only one engine, if two engines were to go out at this point. So, Discovery has made a successful launch, it is on its way to orbit, and uh, we're going to go back and show you that spectacular, always spectacular view of the liftoff at the Cape just uh, five minutes ago. Ten, we are go for main engine start. Seven, six, we have main engine start. Three, two, one, and... Liftoff, liftoff of Discovery, and the first flight to retrieve and return satellites from space, and the shuttle has cleared the tower. Low program initiated, Houston now controlling. Roll program completed. That's a beautiful picture coming up here, coming through the cloud cover. It certainly is. This, of course, is uh, the second Beginning flight of the uh, shuttle Dispatch Discovery. To, uh, uh, you were on the uh, maiden voyage, and this one is a very ambitious, perhaps NASA's most ambitious mission, where the uh, crew aboard Discovery will make an attempt to recover two errant satellites. Uh, the first one will, the retrieval will take place on Monday, and then two days later, on Wednesday, they'll attempt to recover the, uh, the second uh, satellite. In addition, uh, tomorrow, they will launch the first of two communication satellite, and then on uh, the next day, they'll launch the second one. So stay with us. We'll continue our extended coverage of uh, NASA's 14th mission for the space shuttle.